Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today for this webinar session on the interesting topic, how are ciphers made? Cryptography from an idea to practical applications. This event is brought to you by the NTU Institute of Advanced Studies, the Graduate Student Clubs of the School of Physical and Mathematical Sciences and the Computer Science and Engineering. My name is Shivam and I'll be your host for this webinar. Before we begin, there are some housekeeping rules for this webinar. All of your mics have been muted to prevent accidental disturbance. If you'd like to ask questions during the Q&A session, please use the raise hand feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. When your name is called, please ask your question. Alternatively, you can also post your questions under the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. For the post-grad students who require the endorsement of the attendance, we'll appreciate that your name and affiliation is shown such as my name, that is, your name and in the brackets, please write the school you are affiliated with. It will help our admin colleagues to keep track of your attendance. Additionally, at the end of the session, do scan the feedback form and indicate the need for endorsement. Now let's get started. Today's webinar is being organized as a part of the Discovery Science Seminars and Interviews Initiative. Let me introduce our speaker for today's webinar, Professor Thomas Perrin. Professor Thomas received his doctorate in cryptography from Orange Labs formerly known as France Telecom, following which he worked as a cryptography expert at Ingenico and a postdoctoral researcher at the School of Physical and Mathematical Sciences, NTU. He has received many accolades during his academic career, and currently he is working as an associate professor in SPMS, NTU. Without further ado, let's welcome Prof. Thomas. Prof. Thomas, please. Thank you. Thank you very much for this nice introduction. Um, okay, so actually I... Um, I looked at the, so hi everyone, of course. Uh, I looked a bit at the list of attendees and I realized that maybe most of you don't know so much about cryptography at all. So I changed a little bit the, the focus of this presentation. Um, so for this presentation, I will not assume that you know anything at all about cryptography. So I will really uh, just go on the, really on the surface and I'm not going to all the mathematical details, etc. So I don't expect anything, any prior knowledge from you on, on this. So this is my, um, this presentation will be basically my personal take on two big results that we have obtained um, in our lab. So I would like to mention that this result is not just me, it's uh, actually the result of a, an entire team. So of course, all credits uh, goes, uh, goes to them also. Um, so here, what I'm, does it work? Yeah, okay. So what I'm gonna do is basically talk about two uh, big results we obtain. One is on the design side. So we designed basically a, a cipher that's actually one uh, competition. I'm gonna talk a bit uh, about this after. And the other result is more on the analysis, trying to break ciphers. And we managed to break one quite famous primitive. So that's the two big results we, we obtained recently. And I will try to give you my personal take on what led basically, what are what were the key factors that, that led to this uh, to these two results, which I believe are important factors. Um, note that I don't claim that this is um, applicable to anyone. Um, I think we are all different uh, types of researchers. Uh, I can see some researchers being successful, even, you know, even of course, if they don't follow these uh, this advices, but this is just my, my personal. So maybe what I should do first is to introduce you a bit to, to cryptography. Sorry, I'm going to take a bit of time to, to do that because that's uh, what I need to do uh, in order for you to, to better understand what were exactly these, uh, these results. So what is cryptography? Um, so cryptography is basically the science of, uh, of secrecy. So basically trying to protect all the information. So either the information that, that, you, that you communicate with someone else, or maybe the information that you store in your hard drive. Okay, so it's really trying to protect the information. What I really like in cryptography is that it's a mix of different uh, domains, different research domains. Of course, the main one is mathematics because we use mathematics uh, to, to have special kind of structures that will allow us to design all these ciphers and also to analyze them. Okay, so it provides all the tools that we need to actually design and break the, the, the ciphers. But it also uses computer science because most of the cryptography that uh, you're going to create, it's going to be run on computers. So if you want this cryptography to be efficient, uh, you're going to need to understand how computers are working, what are the implementation tricks that you can use, um, what are the different platforms that, uh, that you can use and how to make it efficient on this platform on, on, on this other one. And this of course involves a lot of, um, of uh, programming and computer science. 
But there's also another one, which is electro electronics, because uh, maybe your algorithm will not be imp implemented in software, but maybe it's going to be directly implemented in a chip. And in that case, you need to understand hardware implementation and uh, how, again, to make it efficient in hardware. So it's, uh, it will involve also some, uh, some, uh, some electronics. And basically, when I look at the people working in cryptography, I really see a lot of different, uh, I mean, people are coming from different areas. I see like mathematicians, computer scientists, really uh, people also coming from electronics. And most of the time they have kind of a dual uh, degree background. So they are good in math and in electronics or good in math and computer science. And that's personally what I really like in, in cryptography. So it's, it's, uh, it's quite widespread. So what do we study in cryptography? Um, I would say what most people think of when they think of cryptography is they think of confidentiality. So confidentiality is basically when you want to cipher the data that you're transmitting. So we got um, one person, Alice, that wants to communicate with Bob. So most of the time in cryptography, we use uh, traditionally, we use uh, Alice and Bob as, a, as a people to, to show the example as names. So Alice would like to communicate with Bob, but she only has an insecure canal of communication to communicate. So she would like to send these messages, but she don't want Eve, the attacker, so someone that, is, uh, that has bad intentions, to be able to listen to this, uh, this message. So what you would like to do is to have some kind of protection to be placed on the message. So that's what is represented with this, this lock here. So we like to protect Cypher, basically, the message, so that even if Eve received this encrypted message, she cannot recover what has been uh, said in this message. So that's confidentiality. Now, there is another, um, uh, another type of problem that we are studying, which is equally important. It's called authentication. Because indeed, Eve might not be just listening to uh, the communication, she might be also able to modify it. So let's imagine that Alice sends uh, to Bob some message saying, for example, uh, Bob is a bank, for example, and say trans, uh, transfer $15 uh, to this person. Imagine that if Eve modifies the message, even though she doesn't understand what's going to be the modification because it's encrypted, but she tries to modify something. And then the message be became, instead of $15, it became $1 million. Okay, of course, that would be a big problem. So Bob basically wants to be sure that the message that he receives indeed came from Alice and modified. Okay, so that's what authentication is about. And this is a concept that is, uh, of course, very important in practice as well. So basically for authentication, we want to have this kind of signature here that you put on your message that will somehow prove to the receiver that you actually wrote this message and no one else. Now, cryptography so studies this pure problem, confidentiality, authentication, etc., but also much more complex problem, uh, which involves many more uh, different subparts and subprotocols and, and security definitions, much, some uh, much higher level, um, I would say, protocols, such as electronic voting, for example, uh, which is uh, a problem that is extremely complex. Uh, you can think of smart contracts, uh, cryptocurrencies, which is uh, quite hot at the moment. Uh, you can think of, for example, if I want to do some computation on encrypted data, this is something that a lot of people are researching on at the moment, is much, much more complex. So here in this talk, I will mostly con uh, concentrate on confidentiality and authentication. That's the kind of uh, crypto I personally am uh, studying. So that's what I'm, we're going to talk in this, uh, in this talk. So um, cryptography is really used everywhere. I'm 100% sure you have been using cryptography thousands of times. Uh, in your lives already, maybe without uh, uh, notifying it. So, of course, any moment where you're transmitting some data, you're going to very probably be using cryptography. So if you're using your phone, of course, your data is going to be uh, uh, encrypted and authenticated. Um, if you think of banking, of course, the banks will have a lot of protocols to secure all their financial data and also to secure all the data that they store uh, in, their, in their systems. You can think of access control where you need some protocol to be able to authenticate the person. Logistic, um, maybe you have some goods and you like to have some tag to track your, your goods, but you want only yourself to be able to track all these goods and not someone else. So you need, again, some kind of authentication and also encryption to be sure that only you can do that. You can think of medical devices. Um, if you have some heart uh, uh, issues, for example, and you place a small device to help you with the, this condition, of course, you don't want anyone to be able to tamper with this device. So you want to make sure that only you or your doctor can access the, the device, otherwise it could lead to a catastrophe. So basically in PC, cell phones, smart cards, on internet, in cars, in supply chain, the 
area of cryptography is really uh, really large and it's uh, it's basically never uh, it's never stopping of, of growing uh, cybersecurity is becoming more and more important and uh, with more and more devices in our everyday lives this is uh, something that's not going to change soon so we have two big when you look at cryptography we have two big families of cryptography symmetric key and asymmetric key cryptography so let me explain to you very briefly what's the difference between them so we have Alice and Bob that would like to communicate. Again, they have only an insecure canal of communication. So what, they, what we assume is that they have a key like uh, depicted in red here, that is a secret. So this key here is the same for Alice and Bob. And we assume it's already uh, shared between them before the protocol starts. Then if Alice would like to send a message encrypted, she will use that secret key to encrypt with some cryptographic protocol, Never mind for the moment. So she used that key to and send it to, to the encrypted message to Bob. You can see that only Bob has this secret key, so only he can um, decipher this message. If she would like to also provide some authentication on top of this, she would produce some kind of signature that she will put with the message. And she will, uh, she will be again using that red key, secret key, and only Bob knows as this red key, so only he can verify if this message was indeed sent by Alice or not. Now, for this symmetry key cryptography, why we call this symmetry key is because the two keys that are used by the two participants is the same. So it's completely symmetrical. So the good thing is that with the really huge advantage with this is that it's usually very fast. Okay, so the um, operations, the type of operation that is involved in symmetry key cryptography is very, very efficient. And you can compute this on a, on a huge amount of data without any problem. The problem on the other side is that it uses a lot of keys. So if you consider that you have n users, and each user will like to communicate between each of them. You're gonna need, I mean, the number of keys that you're gonna need basically will grow in N square, okay? Because you're gonna need to have a key between each of the pairs of user. And that's a bit of a problem. That's, a, I mean, if N grows large, this uh, N square is gonna be also large. Another big issue is that you need to pre-share the key. So indeed, I assume that the keys in red were already shared between the two participants, but they only have an insecure uh, canal of communication to, to, to communicate. So how can they do that? How can they pressure the key? That's a big problem. You're kind of only pushing the problem a bit further, but in the end, you're not really solving it. So on the other side, asymmetric key cryptography is a bit the opposite. So here, uh, each user will just generate not a secret key between one user and another, but just he will generate his own pairs of keys. So you have two keys now, a public key and a private key. So the private key is the one inside the circle. So this private key is known only by the user itself and no one else. And the public key is outside the circle to say that this is public. You display, you broadcast it, broadcast it to everyone. Everybody can know this, uh, this key. Now, if Alice would like to send a message to Bob, she takes the message and she takes the public key of Bob. It's the public key, so she can have access to it. So she takes the public key of Bob and use that public key to encrypt the message. And then she sends to Bob that encrypted message. Now, it turns out that the public key and the private key, they are linked together mathematically. There is some relation, special relationship that is such that Bob with this private key is the only one that can uh, decipher this message that was encrypted with the public key. If she wants to now authenticate this message, so to have some kind of signature put on top of it, she will use her own private key. Okay, so only Alice knows her own private key, so only her can sign this message. Now she sends this authentication tag to Bob, but Bob that will then use the public key of Alice to verify this uh, authentication tag, basically. So you can see the setting is a bit different here. The nice thing that we have with, uh, with asymmetric key cryptography is that we only use two N keys for N user. Indeed, each user has two keys. If we have N user, we have two N keys in total. That's much, much less than something that grows in N square. The other good thing is that we don't need to pressure the keys here because each user will generate his own pair of keys and that's it. You just broadcast your public key to everyone and that's it. So it's a much easier setting to handle than symmetric key cryptography. The big, big issue is that it's super slow. Most of the operation, the type of operation that are used for asymmetric key cryptography, sorry, um, will involve the very um, like uh, large and, and complex mathematical structures that makes them hard to implement and, and very slow. So what happens in practice when you connect uh, on the internet on when you use your phone and there is some cryptography involved, most of the time what will happen 
you will use both. You will use both asymmetric cryptography and symmetric cryptography. First, you're going to use asymmetric cryptography here to set the connection, okay? Because the setting is very easy. Once the secure connection is, is set, you're going to use this secure connection to create a new key, exchange it between you two, and then you're going to switch to symmetric cryptography. So basically, you start with asymmetric cryptography, generate a red key like this one, share it between you two, and then you can use you can switch to symmetric cryptography, which is much faster. And then you can communicate with large uh, files, video, whatever, and that is going to be efficient. That's what happens in practice most of the time. So I personally work in symmetric cryptography, not on the asymm asymmetric key uh, part. So what I'm going to talk today is about uh, symmetric key. And there are two main components that are used in symmetric cryptography. It's hash function and symmetric key ciphers. And that's the two things, the two results, basically, uh, we're going to talk about in this talk. So, oh, yeah. So also, yeah, we will concentrate on pure problems. Um, so here we'll only deal with confidentiality and authentication, not the more fancy kind of uh, security problems. Uh, just uh, something quite simple like confidentiality and authentication. So how to design a cipher? Again, this is uh, about the introduction. I'm trying to. I will be trying to explain to you roughly what are the main ideas, how you actually uh, design a cipher in order to better understand our our uh, results. Yeah, so sorry, I have some construction work uh, that just started now. I'm sorry about this. I hope it's okay. Um, so first, what we use when we, uh, when we uh, want to use a cipher, we use what is called a block cipher, actually. So a block cipher is the same as what you would imagine of a cipher. It's just that it operates on a block, on a fixed size block. Okay, so what is the, usually the size that is, uh, that is considered? It's 128 bits most of the time. That's actually the current standard that everybody's using. It's called AS-128, and it operates on 128 bits of data. So P here is the plain text. This is basically the unencrypted message that you would like to cipher. Key here represents the key that you use for ciphering, and C is the ciphertext. So all here in AS will be 128 bits. So what you want here with this block cipher is not to have any function. For example, if you use the identity function, this will be, of course, very bad because you will not cipher anything at all. What you want is some very specific security properties to be ensured. The first one is that you want for an attacker to be difficult to, re to recover the key K. So even if you interact with the plain text and the cipher text, the first, um, the first thing that we want is basically we want it to be hard to recover the, 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 the secret key. So the key, as I mentioned, is 128 bits. We call the size of the key number of bits, we call it K, okay, small K. So we want it for the attacker that it takes at least two to the K operation to recover this key. Basically, we want for him that he can only try all possible keys randomly in order for, for him to recover. He should not have any kind of shortcuts to be able to recover that key. That's the first thing that we want. Second thing that we want is that we want it to be hard also for him to recover any information about the plain text or the cipher text. So basically, if he's interacting with the cipher, if he's just seeing plain text cipher text pairs, but for example, if he has a lot, lot of cipher text, it should be hard for him to tell, okay, I know what kind of plain text by cipher. It should be completely random to him. That's the two kind of properties we want to ensure with this block cipher. To give you some kind of idea of what security level we are looking for, um, take for example, um, one like six months of computation, like how much operation can you do with six months of computation? If you use your own computer, probably you can perform two to the 50 roughly uh, operation on your own computer. If you are a researcher in a well-funded university, like uh, it's the case in NTU, you can potentially do up to two to the 64 if you use big computation clusters. Uh, that's actually, um, as I'm going to explain later, that's uh, the kind of competition we actually performed was uh, about 264. If you are a Google or if you are the NSA, so much, much more uh, better funded uh, agencies or companies, then maybe, maybe you can reach 280. I'm not even sure about this. I'm not even sure if 280 is currently reachable, but maybe you can, or maybe in a close future, it will be possible. But the key point is that it's impossible to perform to the 128 operation. This is way, way, way too big. This number is so huge that you're never gonna be able to, to do this number of per operation. So this is why we're using 128 bit of key here. The key size is very important because this is what defines your security level. And if you use 128 bit and if your cipher is secure, 
you're going to have to go to 2 to the 128 bit operation to find the key. And hopefully, this is impossible. So, this block cipher is used basically for confidentiality to encrypt your data. But as I mentioned, this is working on a fixed box size. So, you need this is just a building brick, but you need on top of that some what we call an operating mode that's going to define how you're going to use this brick to cipher any length of data, small one, big ones, uh, just an email, or maybe just a large video file, whatever you want to, to, to cipher, you need some operating mode to stipulate how you're going to use this block cipher to cipher everything. But basically, this is the main primitive that is used for confidentiality most of the most, most, most places. So now I'm zooming a little bit inside. So let's try to see how these block cipher are actually designed. So first, maybe something trivial, but uh, there are often some misconceptions about this. A lot of people will believe that uh, designing a secure cipher is very difficult. Like it's, uh, it's very um, a difficult task to be sure that you cannot break a cipher. Actually, this is not really true. Designing a, a very secure cipher is, is quite easy. If you ask me now to design a cipher for which I'm really 100% sure nobody will be able to break it, it's not so difficult. The problem is that this cipher will be probably very slow because I'm gonna use a lot, a lot of operation, very complex operation. And it's gonna be, yeah, so complex that it's gonna be extremely slow. On the other side, if I want to design something that is very efficient, it's, it's very easy for me because I know how computers are working. I know which operations are efficient. So I can design a cipher that's gonna be efficient, but maybe not so secure. What is difficult is to have both at the same time. So have something that is secure and efficient at the same time. This is, I mean, these two constraints are a bit uh, contradicting to each other. And that's exactly the reason why we are all working in this domain is to try to find something that's secure and efficient at the same time. So there is one uh, very famous principle when you want to um, create a cipher. It's called the Kirchhoff's principle. The idea is that when you design a cipher, the only thing that should be secret is the key, right? I told you there is this uh, key K that is secret. That's the only thing that should be secret about your design. The design itself, like how the um, uh, cryptographic algorithm operates and what are the different operations you're going to be doing, etc. this should be public. The reason is because the security, you don't want the security to rely on the fact that nobody knows what your cipher is. You have the impression that if you create a cipher, if you keep it for yourself and you don't disclose to anyone that you're, what is your cipher, it's going to improve your security. It actually, in practice, it's not so true because at some point, someone will be able to understand how your cipher is working. So this is actually true in, in practice. A lot of industry players have been doing this, creating their own cipher, keeping it private in the hope that uh, it's going to increase the security and, and make it harder for an attacker. But in the end, people managed to reverse engineer basically the, the, the algorithm. And the problem is that if nobody checked your algorithm before, there's a very, very high chance you made a mistake and your, your cipher is actually easy to break. So this public scrutiny is extremely important in cryptography. You, people will only believe in your design, in the security of your design, if you made it public, for a long period of time, a lot of people took a look at it and nobody could break it. That's how you get confidence in the cipher. Now, when you want to uh, design the ciphers, uh, there is two, like I would say, properties that you really want from the cipher. This is uh, quite old, it dates back to uh, Claude Shannon in 1945. So this is diffusion and confusion. So this is the two really two properties, building pro properties that you want in your cipher. So what's the idea of diffusion? Diffusion is basically, if I take the plain text and I make a small, small, small modification, I just flip one bit of my plain text. What I want to see on the output, on the ciphertext, is a lot of bits flipped, like randomly. You know? I, I want some random behavior, basically. So if I flip one bit on the, on the input, I want to see a lot of bits a bit randomly uh, flipped. If my diffusion is not good enough, what will happen is that I'm gonna flip one bit and only maybe two or three bits or four bits will be flipped and not the rest. This is really not some random behavior. This is not something we want to see. So this is what diffusion is about. You want to make sure that the dependency between one bit and the other bits of the state is, 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 is a very high, basically. So you want uh, every bit to depend on every, every bit of the state to depend on every bit of the plain text and every bit of the key very quickly. This is diffusion. Confusion on the other side um, takes a look at What's the complexity of this dependency? 
So let's assume now again, I flip one bit of the plain text and I got a lot of bits flipping on the ciphertext because of that. If the pattern of bit flipping that appears on the output is very simple, very easy to understand, that's also bad. It's also something that does not look random. So I want the dependency, the mathematical function that links these bits to the output bits to be also very strong and very uh, complex, basically. This confusion, uh, more or less, what I want is some highly nonlinear function to make sure that this relationship will be complex. So that's the two basic foundational um, concepts that we want when we design the cipher. So I zoom a bit more now. Let's take a look at how these block ciphers are actually uh, designed. So this is my plain text input, okay? So the, the part that is not ciphered yet, this is my key input, and this is my ciphertext here. So the encrypted data. So most cipher that, uh, that have been designed and that you're using, they're actually using what we call an uh, iterated uh, process. So it means that we are gonna have one run function, is depicted in here, and you apply the same run function many times, okay? So you apply this run function many times and you hope that after maybe 10 rounds, 50, 20 rounds, depend on what components you're gonna be using, you hope that you're gonna get something secure after this many rounds. If you use only one round, you sure it's not gonna be secure. If you use two rounds, it's gonna be a bit better, better, et cetera, but maybe after 20 rounds, then you know you're gonna have something good. So why we use this iterated process? It's because it's much simpler. It's simpler to analyze, which is very important. It's also simpler to implement. So if you look at in hardware implementation, for example, having a function that is always different, like we do a, one function here and then another function here and then another function here, it, this will take a large, large, large area and it will, will not be efficient at all. So the fact that you're using the same thing repeated over and over again makes it much, much more efficient. So now I'm zooming a bit inside this, this F function. So you can see that the, we get the key, some key material here is incorporated every round, you incorporate some key material inside the state. This, this function G is, is just to say that you can update the key material if you want. But this uh, F function is the where everything is actually happening. Okay, that's the, the actual, all the details will go in here. The confusion, the diffusion will mostly happen in this F function. So let's take a look at inside this F function, what happens. Oops. So the F function will be depicted in, in here. Okay, so this is the part. So what we would, most of the cipher we do, so th this, is one, this is one construction of, of block cipher. There are other types of construction, but this is the most uh, popular one, I would say. So what, what will happen is you take your plain text. So again, that's like 128 bit, for example, and you will divide this into small chunks. So you will apply this small function S on each of these chunks. The chunks is, are usually four bit, eight bit, for example. So this S is what we call uh, S box or sub substitution box. It's a small permutation, which uh, is supposed to have like strong cryptographic properties. So this is the part that provides the confusion, okay? This function is supposed to be nonlinear, and this is what will provide all the confusion in your cipher. Once you have done this, you need to make sure that you get enough diffusion. You need to make sure that all the bits depend on all the bits. So you need to mix all these box from between each other. This is why you got this L part here. This is a linear layer, L stands for linear layer. And the role of the linear layer is really to provide diffusion. So try to mix as much as possible all the different things. And it does not have to really provide any confusion here. Okay, so you got this S blocks here and the L blocks here. And now the entire, my entire job basically is to try to find good mathematical properties, structures in order to build the S box here. And also all the types of uh, mathematical structure to provide the L uh, layer here. And of course, I want this to be secure and also efficient, okay? Remember that efficiency is a, is a key part here. As a cryptanalyst, so if I want to then analyze the security of this, I will need to analyze the security of S, I will need to analyze the security of L, I will need to analyze the combination of both, so what happens when I take S and L, and I will also need to analyze all the different rounds. So I need to analyze the security when I iterate this throughout the mini rounds. So this is really what the job of, of creating ciphers and analyzing them is about. I'm not gonna go into much more detail than this, like how we actually build all these S-boxes, how we actually build this uh, linear layer. This is the moment where really mathematical part uh, starts and this is a bit difficult to explain in, in just this one hour talk. So just to give you some uh, idea of the timeline, 
um, if you design a cipher, an academic cipher, for industry cipher, it's a bit different because they have different um, different goals and uh, uh, yeah, the situation might be a bit different. But if you if you want to have your, your cipher coming from academia to be used uh, everywhere, maybe in the industry, what happens is that first you're gonna design your cipher. So maybe it's gonna take you um, one year of work. You, you're gonna identify why you need a cipher, what kind of performances you want to get, what kind of security you wanna get. And you need to come up with something really simple. It has to be simple because if it's too difficult, it's gonna be also too difficult to analyze and that's a big issue. You want it to be really simple. It has to be simple. So you design your cipher, maybe it's gonna take you one year. Then you also have to do at the same time your own cryptanalysis, which means that if you design a cipher and you propose it to uh, the community, you cannot come up with something for which you did not analyze the security. If you try to publish a paper like this, it's gonna be rejected for sure. So you need to perform your own security analysis. Actually more than that, you need to perform the security analysis and you also have to show to everyone very good, strong arguments that your cipher is resisting all the existing state of the art attack. So you take all the existing attack and you show how oh, my cipher is resisting against this kind of attack because see, I have put this special protection and I can mathematically analyze that this kind of attack will not work because I'm, I, I have this and this happening. This is the kind of uh, arguments that we'll do. You can even sometimes make security proofs. So security proofs means that you're gonna assume that your attacker is limited to only be able to do this kind of action, this kind of action, this kind of action. And in this particular model, you're gonna be able to show like mathematically that you cannot break your cipher. Now, how good is the model compared to practice? That's not a problem, but you know, this gives an extra layer of, uh, of confidence in your cipher. So you came up with your cipher, you have done your own cryptanalysis, then you can try now to publish it or maybe submitting to a competition like we, uh, like we have done. And then it, you basically pray. You hope that nobody will break your cipher in the next five to 10 years. And this is uh, a part which is really important. Lots of ciphers actually get, get, get broken during the, this phase, but no one should be using a cipher that has been just produced basically, because we're still not sure about the security. You have to wait many years and a lot of people to take a look at it before you can actually consider putting this into production and using it everywhere. So even if it's still stand, and if the performances are good, maybe you can consider standardizing. So you can go to ISO, or you maybe I can check with the NIST or ANSI, so any kind of standardization body, or the one that you prefer, and see if they will be interested to standardize it. And even once it's standardized, you still have to wait maybe five, 10 years before the industry actually pick your cipher because it takes a lot of money to move from one primitive to another one. So you can see that the timeline is really quite long. Since the day you have to produce a cipher up to the day is actually used, it might take maybe one decade or even two. So um, now I would like to talk about the, the two results that we obtained recently, which I, I think were um, interesting results. And I think that's the two big results that uh, came out from our lab in the, in, the, in the past years. So first one is the CESAR competition. So let me explain to you a bit what is this competition. So first, I would like to very quick, quickly explain to you what is authenticated encryption. So you have already, we have already seen what is confidentiality, right? It's basically encrypting the data. We have seen what is authentication. It's basically putting some kind of signature on your data to be sure that it was sent by the actual person it's pretending to be sent from. But actually in most application, you don't want one property or the other. You actually want both at the same time. You want confidentiality and authentication at the same time. It turns out that if you use a very good primitive for confidentiality and a very good primitive for authentication, there are many ways to make mistake and try to use both at the same time and have some security issue. And this actually happened in practice. Um, there have been some attacks on some protocols because of this. So what the community thought that maybe since in most applications we need both, then we should come up with one single primitive that do both things at the same time. So authenticated, authentication and encryption, sorry. Authentication and encryption, and we call this authenticated encryption. The other good thing is that potentially it can also lead to um, efficiency uh, improvements because you don't have to go through the confidentiality part and then the authentication part. Maybe you can combine them so that you can save some operation. And this is actually what's happening. So this is why um, people got really interested um, relatively recently in uh, authenticated encryption. So what happened is that the community thought, since we have this new uh, primitive we'd like to see, Let's uh, motivate people to work on this by 
having some competition. And this is the CESAR competition. It stands for Competition for Authenticated Encryption, Security, Applicability, and Robustness. It was a five-year competition, starts in 2014, and it was reorganized by the community. So, that, so there were a few, uh, maybe a dose, a bit more than a dozen researchers, like very high-level professors um, that were basically composing the committee. Uh, and they, they, could, uh, they could not submit, actually, all the people from the community cannot, could not submit a design, otherwise they would be biased, of course. And they, they, they were in charge to actually choosing in the end what would be the winner. So we had uh, 57 submissions from all over the world, from Singapore, uh, Europe, US, China, India, uh, Australia. We had really from everywhere in the world. Uh, the teams were usually quite large. Uh, I mean, for some of them, it was quite large. Um, we had people from academia, people from the industry. So this was very, very diverse. Then what happens for this competition? It goes with several rounds. So let's say roughly every year you get one round, roughly. And every year you're gonna cut some candidates. So you're gonna remove them because maybe they were not secure. Someone came up with an attack and say, okay, you can see this cipher is not behaving how it's supposed to be behaving. So yeah, it's, it's removed basically. Or maybe some candidates were secure, but they were not efficient enough compared to the other candidates. So they also got removed. Or you can be for uh, various reasons. So after many, many rounds, in the end, you get a few winners. Um, and what is interesting is that a lot, a lot of uh, work was actually generated thanks to this competition. There have been a lot of cryptanalysis conducted, so a lot of attacks, uh, a lot of schemes getting broken, a lot of performance measured. It takes a lot of time to measure um, the performance of the cipher to really compare them in different uh, scenario, depending on software, hardware. There's a lot of different kind of platforms for software you might consider. So it takes really a lot of time and effort. If you're interested, you can click on, on the link later. I guess the slide will be shared. You can click on the link if you want to, to see the various candidates and, and the teams that you put up. So the final portfolio, the final selection, the winners basically for the CISA competition were as follows. So you got three different groups. Uh, the first group is lightweight application. So lightweight application means cryptography for very small constrained devices like uh, RFID tags, for example. So very, very small, tiny devices that has small computing capabilities. The first one is uh, that the winner was Ascon. It's, a, it's a, one designed from a European team. And the second one was Acorn. And actually, Acorn was designed by an NTU professor, uh, on Prof. Onjung Wu. Uh, so we are very happy uh, that NTU is actually a place, uh, second uh, place candidate in, in this portfolio. Uh, in the second portfolio, high performance application, this means uh, basically high end servers. Okay? So you have a, a server that say, is handling a lot, a lot of data from all your websites. Uh, so you want something very, very fast in software. And the two winners were Aegis and OCB. And Aegis is also a design um, from a Profond Junwoo. So again, we are very happy to have uh, someone again from NTU uh, being co-winner of this portfolio. And the last portfolio is Defense in Depth. So this was a portfolio for extra security, basically. Um, um, designs that were providing more than just the, the, the security that uh, authentic and encryption algorithm usually provides. They will go a bit further up and try to uh, come up with extra protection, basically. I will explain uh, very briefly after what this is about. And the first one, the winner, was Deoxys 2, which was uh, one design that uh, my team and myself um, created. And so in the end, uh, I think NTU could be really, really proud of this because this was an inter inter international competition involving all the best cryptographers in the world. And NTU managed to place one candidate in each of the portfolio, and I think this is really, really uh, outstanding. So just to explain to you in one slide what Deoxys is about. Uh, again, there's a lot of mathematical things involved and I cannot go into detail here. I just want to roughly explain to you the idea of why it was selected. So the portfolio was higher security. It turns out that if you use more data, the more data that you encrypt, the somehow the lower will be the security of your cipher. So this graph here shows on the y-axis the security that you get. So you see that you, we want on top 128 bit of security. And the x-axis represents how much data you're going to be ciphering. This is in log, log scale, okay, for both of them. So this is the amount of data you, you're going to be basically ciphering. And you can see that the more data you're ciphering, for most of the candidates, you get the security decreasing. So what we produce are two candidates, one for which the security is not actually decreasing at all when you cipher more data, and the other one is indeed decreasing, but the, the, the steepness of the curve is, is relative, relative, relatively better. And this Deoxys 2 has an added feature. So again, I cannot explain in, in details here, but 
uh, you get some scenarios where some user might misuse uh, the cryptographic algorithm. Basically, you have some rules you have to follow how to use the, the cryptographic algorithm, and some user might actually screw up and, and, and do things badly. Yeah, yeah, unfortunately, it happens in practice. And Deoxys 2 is, is an algorithm that provides on top of that some resistance. Even if the user do something bad, the security will not completely drop to zero, but it will stay quite good. So that's uh, one of the key factors that made uh, Deoxys 2 uh, the winner, I think. So my personal view, what, what I think what were the key factors that led to that discovery in our lab? Um, first is um, we took some time we sat down and, and first, before like working on designing a cipher and, 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 and do the things we usually do, uh, we first spent some time to identify the problem that, that, that matter. So we looked at the competition and we thought, what would be the kind of things we can produce that will make us stand out from the rest, stand out from the existing cipher, stand out from the other, maybe potentially submitted candidate. We really wanted to find something that would be interesting, some interesting, interesting things to solve. And at this point, we didn't care so much if it was uh, possible or not to do. We only care about what can we do. Maybe it's impossible. We didn't care at this point. Once we identify this, then we work on trying to achieve this. And actually, in the end, it was not so, um, so difficult. Um, so we, we worked a lot, tried a lot of different configurations. Um, and, and after do a lot of, uh, of systematic analysis, basically, we have a lot of different parameters. We tried them all with computers, simulations, etc. We managed to find something good enough. And actually, another thing that is important here, uh, I think, is a, is a good organization and planning, uh, because we had to try a lot of different things, and uh, in the end, you very quickly get overwhelmed by all the different things you have to think of, the different components, how they uh, how they interact with each other. For this S box, did we try all possible cases, or maybe we missed one? So we need to really store everything in some files properly organized, so we can retrieve everything in a nice way. If we didn't do that, it would have been much, much, much harder actually to come up with something good. And we, we would have probably made some mistakes or lose time. Uh, that's also another point. Uh, rigor is very important, uh, especially in cryptography, because if you're not rigorous enough, your cipher is not secure, then yeah, it's completely useless. But I think for any kind of science uh, that you're doing, rigor is, is really something important. Um, if, for example, there are many cases, and it actually happen to, 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 to me sometimes, I'm not rigorous enough. I will be producing a cipher. At some point, I might become a bit lazy to verify one point or another. And I think like, yeah, this is probably fine and it's okay. And then I move on, move on, forget about this. And then I move on, move on, try to come up with my cipher. It's, everything is over, everything is measured. I do my crypto analysis, et cetera, only to realize that, oh, there is this mistake actually because I was not rigorous enough. And then everything scrambled. Everything is uh, wasted time, uh, wasted efforts, and then it's, uh, it's very bad. So, Rigor is, is really something important, and it's something I think you learn throughout the, the years of the PhD. Uh, because during the PhD, I think you want to be as try to be as fast as possible. You're excited by your topic, etc. But you have to keep remember. I mean, remember that you have to really verify every step that you do. You have to make sure that uh, it's really well done. If you do an experiment, you have to really make sure that your experiment is well done before moving to the next step. And also, last point I think it is important is uh, you are really have to talk to other people and collaborate. So this work here would not, not have been possible if we didn't talk to other people. Um, because you talk to other people, they have some ideas. Um, maybe it's not solving directly your problem, but it might pop up some new ideas. Oh, maybe you can do that. Use this with another idea from someone else, combine them, and then put my own idea in there. That's really how we came up with this, uh, this result. And I think that's if you want to be productive, collaboration is definitely up to. I don't necessarily say that you have to collaborate to be a successful researcher, but at least it helps in terms of productivity, that's for sure. So I don't know how much time I have left. Uh, to me, so I will um, quickly move on to the next, I think a big result that we had. This time is not about design. This time is about trying to break things. So what we broke is something, some primitive called SHA-1. Um, I will explain to you what is uh, this primitive. So SHA-1 is what we call a hash function. Hash function is something basically very simple. It's just a function that takes as input a message. And this message can be anything. It can be super long, can be super small. It can be absolutely anything. Your hash function has to handle it. But what this hash function will do for each input, it will always output a fixed size 
hash value. So this hash value is usually 128 bits, but now we want something a bit bigger because the bigger is the hash value, the larger is the security. So nowadays we want something like 256 bits of output. So this function is just something that takes a message and I'll put a 256 footprint basically of this message. That's really what it's doing. For this hash function, we don't want, again, any kind of function. Uh, we want a cryptographic hash function. And cryptographic hash function means that we want some security guarantees. We need two things. First one, we need that it's hard to invert the hash function. So if I give you a hash value to you, and I'm not telling you what is the message, it should be hard for you to actually retrieve the original message. Okay, So it's inverting the function should be difficult. Basically, it should cost you two to the n operation, where n is the size of the hash value in terms of bits. Basically, it means you're just trying randomly messages and in the hope that you end up with uh, to the good hash value. The other property that we want is uh, what we call collision resistance. We, we want it to be hard to compute a collision. A collision is two messages, so m and m prime, that are different, they are distinct, but they both lead to the same value, the same hash value. So they collide on the hash value. And we want that it's hard for the attacker to be able to find this. By hard, we mean that it should take two to the end of the two operations. So n again is the hash output size. So we want to be sure that um, the hash function that we create fulfills its two security guarantees. Now, where is it used? Why are hash function interesting? So this is a really simplification, but block ciphers, you can think of block ciphering being used for confidentiality. Hash function will be used for authentication, basically. Okay, it helps in the in many of the authentication process that you're going to use. You you will use something close to a hash function or actually a hash function. Okay, so I'm not going to go into detail here, but please take as granted that hash function is uh, a primitive that is used really a lot, a lot in cryptography in many actually in many places, not only for authentication but for many other things. So one hash function is SHA1. So what is SHA1? It's a 160-bit hash function. So it has 160 bits of output size. Like we mentioned, collision should be in 2 to the n over 2, which means that for SHA-1, you expect that no one can find a collision in less than 2 to the 80 computation. Remember what we said in terms of security levels. 2 to 80 is really a lot of computation. Uh, maybe, maybe Google or maybe the NSA can, uh, can reach this level of computation. I'm not even sure about this. But at the time, SHA-1 is, uh, is now a bit, a bit old. Uh, at the time, it was really impossible to reach that level of, uh, of number of computation. Okay. So it was designed in the 90s by the NSA, so the American uh, Security Agency. It's an uh, American standard, and it's used worldwide. So if you used uh, some cryptography maybe 10 years ago, uh, it was 100% sure you would be using SHA-1 all over the place. The problem is that SHA-1 has been broken. In 2005, there was a Chinese team of researchers that came up with an attack. And this attack required 2 to the 69 operation. So this is what we call a theoretical attack because they have described this attack in theory, but they could not verify it in practice because 2 to the 69 is such a huge number, they could not actually run it. So a lot of people actually worked on trying to find the first collision for SHA-1. And this was very useful because the industry, so all the companies basically using SHA-1, uh, they have been very slow at moving away from SHA-1. Normally, if you are an industry player and you are using some cryptographic algorithm and one of them gets broken, you have to quickly move away from it because your users might be at risk. So you have to remove this function. But the problem is that it costs a lot of money. It costs a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of effort to remove the uh, cryptographic function. Really, it's an extremely painful process to remove a uh, cryptographic function from some products, really. So unfortunately, the industry have been very slow to move away from SHA-1 because they were all thinking, this is just a theoretical attack. We don't care so much about theoretical attack. It's not really a danger. But yeah, actually, it is in the in practice. And we had to wait only to, to, to 2017 to have modern uh, internet browser to reject SHA-1. So if you take uh, Internet Explorer, uh, Google Chrome, for example, it's only in 2017 that I actually started rejecting SHA-1 completely. But even though your brothers is, uh, are, are, are rejecting this, SHA-1 is still used in many, many places, unfortunately. So if you want to be sure uh, what kind of uh, cryptographic hash function you're using, 
uh, if you connect on some websites, you can click on the small lock that you have that says basically telling you that this website is, is secure. You can click on this lock, look at the properties of the certificate, and you will see, for example, here, signature hash algorithm. It's written SHA-256. And this is a secure hash function. That's a, that's a good one. Nobody has been able to break this one. But if you one day see a SHA-1 here, then probably it's a very bad sign. So a lot of people then tried to come up with the first uh, collision for SHA-1. So after a lot, a lot, a lot of work, a lot of improvements of the attacks, uh, we managed to produce at NTU the first SHA-1 freestart collision. It's not exactly the main collision for SHA-1. It's something a little bit easier, but it's uh, very close to it, basically. And how we did that, so again, a lot of improvements in the attack, but also um, we have designed a custom uh, cluster of GPUs and actually for the fun story, so this, this is a picture taken in one of the data centers in, in, uh, in, in NTU. Um, the people from the data centers were not really happy with, with this when we came up with this, because what you see here are gaming towers. So this is gamers PC, basically. You got 16 of them in these racks. And this takes a lot of space. That's why they were not so happy. Usually when you have some cluster, you will see some racks and you can place those racks one after another. It's a nice shape. So you can put a lot of them in one, in one uh, column. That's what they want to see. But so when we came up with this gamer PC, they were not really happy. Why we came up with this gamer PC is because actually the GPU for gaming are very cheap. And when you look at how much computing power you can get from the gaming GPU, it's very, very, really, very good and much cheaper deal than when you use uh, more like professional stuff. So this is yeah, the picture of our cluster. We call this the, the Kraken. If you want, you can click on the link if you want to see more, more information about this, uh, this attack, this result. Now, from our uh, attack, uh, Google um, basically took this attack and, and, and applied it on a, their own GPU cluster. So they have a huge, huge, huge number of uh, GPUs. Of course, it's, it's Google. And they were managed to uh, get the first Shaman collision. And again, if you want, you can click on this thing to get more, more information about this. And just uh, last year, uh, we produced something even better which is a SHA-1 choose and preface collision. Again, I'm not going to go into detail, but take as granted that a choose and preface collision is a collision for which the attacker has even more control. And because he has even more control, he can attack much more things. So if you have a choose and preface collision, you can break the certificates that basically is protecting all the websites. It can break modern security protocols. So when you have some security protocols protecting your communication between one entity and another, you can actually break it if you can find choose and preface collision. So it's a much, much stronger deal, basically. And normally it's supposed to be very hard. It's supposed to be much, much harder to find an anomal collision, but we managed to improve uh, a lot the attack. And um, we were also very lucky because the Kraken, so the cluster we used before was not powerful enough. We needed more computation power and it cost a lot of money. So we were very, very um, lucky because at this particular time, uh, maybe you, you have seen that, but if you see the cryptocurrencies, so Bitcoin, etc., the price went really, really super high a lot of people started buying some lot of GPUs because with GPUs, you can do Bitcoin mining and you can potentially get rich if the, the cost of the GPU is not so high and the electricity cost is not so high and what you earn in terms of Bitcoin mining is, is, is high, then you can make a lot of money. And people realize this and there was actually a short, uh, uh, short supply of, um, of, a GPU, of GPUs. Even if you are just a gamer and you didn't care about Bitcoin mining, it would have been hard for you to, to find a, a GPU at that time, an efficient one. So, but it turns out that the price went up super high and then it completely went down. Uh, everything crashed. And just doing Bitcoin mining was not eco uh, economically viable anymore. So it means that all these people, they bought a lot of GPUs and they have nothing to do with these GPUs because just using them for the electricity for mining Bitcoin was not good enough. So they tried to find some projects and uh, we came up with our research project and we managed to negotiate a very 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 cheap price for all this computing power and uh, yeah so basically we managed to find a, a gpu cluster in russia um, that uh, performed a huge amount of computation for really not much and that's how we managed to find this uh, this result and this this got quite a big press coverage uh, if you're interested you can you can click again on this link and you can see more, more details about this uh, this attack so yeah what led to that discovery here, um, if we can say that it's a, a discovery. Uh, this one is a bit different because this is really about, uh, I think, hard work and motivation. So SHA-1 is a topic I started during my PhD. So my PhD, I studied this in 2005. So it means that 
since 2005, I've been working on, on this topic and only in 2020, I even got the final results. So 15 years later, I had to wait 15 years later to be able to see uh, the results there. That, that was not my only topic in the PhD, but that was one of the main topic of my PhD. So it's really about hard work and motivation because you cannot directly get the big results in, in one paper, basically. So how I, I arrived to this result is basically by a lot of small improvements, one at a time. So I, I knew where I wanted to go. I knew what was the final result. I was confident that one day someone would be able to do, maybe not me, but someone would be able to do. And I just spent my time trying to solve one small problem at a time. So it was really a step-by-step -step process. As long as you know where you're going, you can really just focus on one step and, and be patient, basically. Okay, so do not get discouraged because you cannot get the big result just after one year. Um, it's uh, most of the time it does not happen like this. So even if you help a little bit someone else actually to find the result, that's already a, a, a quite a big deal. And again, I think talk to other people, collaborate. That's a very, very important point. Um, we couldn't have get this results if, uh, if other people did not work on this with us. There's a lot of different teams that came up, uh, improved some parts and we reuse their improvements and then they we provide our own and they use our own improvements to also, etc. That's really how it, uh, how it happens. So collaboration is, uh, again, I think key here. Um, I think, yeah, I think we, I still need to stop. It's already uh, almost one hour. I, I prepared some like future research direction in crypto, uh, like what, what are the future big things that uh, people are looking at in crypto. Um, I will not go through all of them. I will, I will skip most of them. I just want to go through, yeah, maybe just a few points. So let me go, this one. yeah, this one. So there's a, now, right now, a new competition organized uh, by the NIST. The NIST is the American uh, standardization uh, basically body. It's uh, the one that everybody will following in cryptography. So they build a competition, they create a competition for lightweight authenticated encryption. So you know already what is authentic encryption and lightweight means you want this to be for only very, very small, tiny devices. Okay, very constrained devices. And um, here, actually, why um, people are interested in this competition is because the NSA recently designed a cipher called the Simon Spec, two ciphers called Simon Spec. Those are block ciphers that could be used potentially for public encryption. And there was a lot of discussion about should we allow uh, NSA cipher to be basically snored out and to be used by everyone. As you know, National Security Agency might have different uh, goals from you. Maybe they can produce ciphers which have a backdoor and they can break. Nobody knows. I, I don't think it's the case, but uh, maybe nobody knows. But we don't want to see that happen. And basically what we provide is a new cipher. We provide a new cipher. The name is Kini. Uh, I think also that was a, an important result of our lab. And we try to, to provide an alternative to the cipher from the NSA. And one key point here is I think ethics is really an important part of your research. Um, so this uh, design skinny maybe was not the most interesting part of my research because I don't think there's a lot, lot of novelty in this uh, design, but we still spend a lot of time, a lot of implementation, a uh, lot of political uh, push basically for this cipher. And I think this is important to actually provide something uh, against the NSA because I don't believe NSA should be actually producing ciphers and, and pushing this for, for, for standardization. And I get a lot of, uh, personally, I, I'm, I'm quite proud of, of, this, of this work because even though it might not be become the, the, the next standard and even though it's not a lot of research, new research involved here, I'm quite happy to provide something that has some impact, not on the research side, but also more on the ethics side. So if you have some, your own values, if you think climate change is a problem, and if you come up with, a, with, a, with some, in your field, something that is better, for example, for, for the environment, for climate change, you should, you should do it, even if the, the research is maybe not the most innovative, but you think it could move a bit things. Um, I think you get a lot of, um, of um, yeah, you, I think you get very proud by doing this and, and it's uh, really fulfilling. Another, one last thing I would like to say. Um, yeah, one last thing is about site channel resistance. So actually, this is, a, this is interesting, I think, in cryptography. So in cryptography, we design all these ciphers. We have to prove that uh, everything is fine. Uh, against the adversary that all the attacks are taken into account and nobody can break it, okay? But it turns out that this is just a model in the end because here we model Alice and Bob to be two entities and you can only interact with the plain text and ciphertext and that's the only thing that you see and you cannot see anything else. 
That's the model that we use. But in practice, it's not the case. In practice, people, what can do, they can do is actually maybe take your device, your maybe your computer, maybe your phone, maybe your encrypting device. They can take it from you and analyze it physically. And it turns out that in cryptography, there's a lot of information going out from the device when it's actually doing the computation. So for example, um, uh, the electromagnetic uh, waves that's come out during the computation or the power consumption, there's a lot of different um, value, uh, physical uh, phenomenon that you can measure during the cryptographic computation. And there's a lot of information about the key in there. It turns out that it's very easy to break uh, design when doing this. So my key point here is that you have to be critical of your assumptions uh, when you do your research. I think that's really important. You have to start with some model because that's how you do research. You model the world in some way, and then you build on that because you need to start somewhere, that's fine. But at some point, it's important in your research that you try to challenge this, you, you try to say, okay, this is the model, but is it really true? Is there some places where this might not be true? How can I solve this? How can I exploit this maybe for, for my benefits? Um, and this, I think, is something that is hard to think when you're a PhD student because you take everything as granted, right? You read books, you hear your supervisor talking about this and that, and you never put this into critic. You take this as completely granted. Uh, that's, that's not challenged, but I think you should challenge this sometime. And from this might, might come very interesting uh, new research. And I see that happening uh, quite, quite a lot. But it takes, I think it takes some maturity to, to, to reach this. Yeah, I think this is, I have, I have solved the slides, but I, I will stop there. I think it's already one hour. Yeah, so thanks for your attention. Thank you, Prof. Thomas, for such an insightful talk. Now I would like to invite our co-host, Gao and Nandish from the School of Computer Science and Engineering to host the Q&A session. Okay, uh, yeah, uh, it's QA session, and uh, we have seen several questions in QA panel. And uh, Professor Pre, can you help us to answer these questions? The first question is uh, asked by Jarasha. Jasra, yeah. Uh, can you see the question? Yeah, Professor? I can. Yeah, okay. I can read it. So when you say, uh, maybe I, I should read it. Uh, so when you say that it's never possible to do to do 128 computation steps in a few months' time, you mean in the near future, right? In a few decades time, we do manage to reach to the 180. We can overcome this problem by increasing the size of the message and the key to a larger size. If so, how easy would it be to transform from 188 to 256? And is encryption and decryption going to be possible for such a large number? So yeah, that's a very good question. So personally, I don't think you will be able to reach to the 128 operation ever, even in the long-term future, because the number of operations that this means the actual energy, even if you consider that you have a comput comp computing device that is so efficient that you, you can read one's operation so efficiently, even in terms of energy, even without the amount of energy you will need to actually perform this competition will be absolutely huge. Like, like I don't know the numbers exactly, but it's, it's completely insane. This number is so huge that it's beyond comprehension, basically. So I don't think personally that 2 to the 128 will be something that you can reach. Something that you might be changing this is if you have uh, quantum computers. So that's actually one slide I, I prepared after, but it's not, uh, I mean, for, for some of the uh, cryptographic algorithm, if you have access to quantum computers, this is a, 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 a catastrophe. You can break everything uh, very easily, but it turns out for symmetric cryptography, the kind of cryptography we are doing, it's not a huge problem. You don't, you just have to basically more or less double the size of the key and then you're fine. So it's relatively easy to do. So your, your second part of your question is, how easy it is to be to move from 128 to 256? It's not so difficult. So a lot of the ciphers um, we design, actually a lot of them, they already have a version with a longer key. So for example, the standard uh, AES that uh, everybody's using, there's already an existing version with 256 bit key. So even if this happens that we have quantum computers, we can already right now move on to something else. Now it's up to the industry to make this effort, to spend the money, spend the time if they want to do that, right? It's also it's about the pressure of the user. If you are concerned with your privacy and if you make uh, this concern uh, heard, then the industry will be uh, hearing you and, 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 and make a change. Uh, but in terms of research, it's, very, it's really not difficult. Everything is already there uh, in order for you to move to 256. And in terms of, that's your last question, is it uh, going to be possible? Yes, it's not much, much long. It's a little bit more costly, but really not much. It's uh, actually not much more costly to move on to like a little bit higher security. Again, here I'm only talking about symmetric cryptography. For asymmetric cryptography, things are really different. I'm only talking about symmetric cryptography. 
I hope this answers your, your question. Yeah. Okay, and uh, we have uh, another two questions from Juncheng. So what are the most powerful state of the art attack now? What attack would potentially be the biggest threat in the future? Is the excluding the threat brought by quantum computers? Okay, well, that's, uh, that's a good question. So, um, so there are not just one single attack that is the best for everyone because there are some attacks that are good for this type of ciphers. There are some other kind of attack that good for this type of ciphers. So it really depends on the kind of construction you'll be using. Um, so most of the attack that we are today looking at is what we call differential attack or linear attack. Differential attack is basically you just insert some small difference in the plain text and you look at how this difference propagates inside your cipher and you try to make some statistics out of it and try to recover the key out of it. That's basically how it works. Now, a lot of the attacks we are using today, even the most advanced one, are kind of variation of this differential or linear attack, okay? But again, there's no, I don't think there's a, there's one big, big, big attack that is better than the others at, at the moment. Um, one big problem, I think, for cryptography now is a side channel attack that I've been just discussing right now, is the fact that we model everything as having entities which are completely protected physically from the attacker. But in fact, it's not the case. You can have some statistics not coming just from the, the, the cipher itself, but from from timing, you, for example, you can you can even do that remotely. You can take a look at the, how much time it takes to compute, uh, to make some computation. And even with that, you can actually recover the key because of very specific effects in some processors, you can do that. And it's very hard to protect against this because processors are, be, are becoming very complex. Uh, you don't know what's gonna be exactly the behavior, like completely, you cannot control it completely. And, and it's really, really difficult to protect uh, against this, yeah. So it's basically a cat and mouse. It's basically a cat and mouse game, right? So you had attackers coming with new attacks and then everybody like, okay, now we have this new attack. We need to write the protection and then they come up with something, et cetera, et cetera. That's how it works. So I see next question is, is there any difference while attacking a symmetric and asymmetric cipher with such an attack? So say, uh, so yeah, yeah, I mean, the, the main process, the main idea is the same. Uh, so it depends what kind of information you're going to be using. Is it a uh, timing attack? Is it, is it uh, power consumption? So the basic idea is the same, but when you do this, uh, this measurement, then you're going to need to correlate these measurements to what's happening inside the cipher. So it then starts to have some cryptanalysis. You, not, you need to start to do some cryptanalysis at this point. And then of course the cryptanalysis will fully depend on the cipher. So the cryptanalysis for AS will be really different from the cryptanalysis on, uh, on elliptic curve cryptography, for example. So yes, in the end, they are actually um, different, different kind of mathematical ideas you might be using. Yeah. Okay, and uh, finally one question I can understand. Uh, a question from Sala. Yeah, I can so understand this. Yeah. How people from history can create such cipher and they don't have academic basis? <laughs> that's <laughs> that's uh, that's a good question. You should not ask me. You should ask them. Okay. So the thing is, uh, uh, yeah, security is security is a bit special. Um, so for me, I for example, for me, I, I work I work in a company uh, before before coming to NTU. I was working uh, as a cryptography expert in uh, some company that was producing uh, paying terminals. You know where you put your 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 banking card and you type your pin code. Uh, they were producing this. So this is actually a lot, there's a lot of security involved in there. And even there, even in that company, a lot of people did not understand security. And they were really critic against me because I, they basically believe I was making the company lose money. They were basically thinking, why do we pay the salary, your salary? Because you're not producing any product. You're not working in this business unit or this business unit. So why are you there? And I tried to explain to them, well, I'm here to avoid some possible issue later. So you cannot measure it now, but if I was not there, maybe you're gonna have to pay a huge price later. And this is something most of the engineers that are not like, they don't know so much about security, they would, it's gonna be difficult for them to understand. And actually the more successful you are, let's say you are very good cryptographer, very, very good uh, at security. And you make sure that nothing happens to your company. Everybody will be like, oh, nothing happens. So we don't need you actually. They don't realize all the work you have been doing uh, for, for that to actually happen. So actually that's the problem of a lot of companies. They think about security at the last moment. Uh, this is usually not their priority. Things are changing now, I think, because we see in the news, a lot of uh, security problems, 
a uh, lot of uh, data breaches and etc so and they have to pay a huge amount of money and they see the impact on their image is very bad so now i think things are changing but before that what happened is a company has to sell a product they want to put some cipher in it but they don't want to pay the price for this which is they want to have an entire cryptographic engineer team because it costs a lot of money so what they would do is they just ask one of the engineer basically the guy who knows a little bit about security to do that they will produce it they will try to keep it private because they don't want everybody to, to know it, you know, believe that this will uh, increase the security. And the classical case is that someone reverse engineer this cipher, find that this is super easy to break and then everything is broken and it's bad for the image. This happened a lot of times, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And uh, uh, here is another, uh, here is a question, a technical question from Anissa. Yeah. So, yeah, so you say, and that a good cipher is a cipher that satisfies confusion and diffusion. After we build a cipher, is it, it is important to do cryptanalysis to that cipher to make sure the security of that cipher. It is important too to do randomness testing to make sure confusion of that cipher before we do cryptanalysis. So yeah, so randomness testing. So there are some uh, tools that you can use. Uh, actually, the NIST provides such tools that allows you to test the randomness of your cipher. Basically, what it will do is we'll try to come up with a lot of uh, different inputs and see if there is some bias in some of the bits. But this is not enough. If you make a, a randomness test like this, if you use a tool, randomness test, and your cipher fails at this test, it means your cipher is not secure at all, at all, like really not secure at all. So this is really the minimum bar you should, you should, you should, you should, met, you should meet. And actually you should have much more than, than that. If you take a cryptanalysis, uh, so someone who's, uh, who knows actually how to break cipher is gonna be able to do much more than just this uh, randomness testing actually. So yes, it's important to do it, but it's definitely not enough to do this. Okay, uh, Professor, you can take a break and you'll say a lot of words. And I can have you ask uh, another question from Trivial. Uh, to, um, how do you get ideas from new discovery other than collaboration? And uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is not a technical question and just about a research, uh, research question, yeah. Yeah, so thanks Trevor for this, for this question. Actually Trevor is my PhD student. So, um, so how to get new ideas other than collaboration? Uh, I, I don't think you can, I mean, okay. I think it's difficult to get, okay. You can get new ideas at start of your PhDs, but it's hard to know if these ideas are interesting or not because you don't know, I, I, that's my, okay. All this is my personal view, okay. Maybe uh, some other researcher will have different views but that's my personal thing. So if basically you can have a lot of new ideas because you get a fresh mind when you arrive at the PhD, uh, but it's hard to know if the, the idea is good or not. So then maybe if you have this kind of idea, you can talk to your supervisor, check if this idea is, might be relevant or not. Most of the time it would not be. For, for me, for example, in my PhD, I had a lot of different ideas. All of them were completely crap, completely crap, really. But hopefully I had a supervisor that were uh, critic enough to tell me, no, don't, don't look for this. This is really a bad idea or whatever. Now, having new ideas, good ones, I think it takes a little bit of time to understand what are the different um, problems. So for example, in terms of cryptography, if you want to do design, if you want to design your cipher, you first need to spend some time breaking ciphers. It's only by breaking ciphers that you understand the effort it is, what are the different constraints. Only then you understand well the problem because it's a very complex problem. Only then you might have, I think, some good ideas, uh, potentially later. So first, I think you need to have some experience in the field to come up with um, interesting and good ideas. Now, in terms of just how to get good, how to get new ideas, I think people have different process for this. For me, it uh, sounds stupid, but I just sometimes I just try random stuff. So, for example, I want to break a cipher. Sometimes I would, I would be like, "What if I do this? Like, what if I take this uh, this bit and try to see what happens if I take this bit of the key and I make something completely." looks completely stupid, really. Most of the time, 99% of the time, it's completely stupid. But sometimes it happens that you, 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 you can get an attack out of it. It, it, it actually happened to me. Uh, what is important in that case is to be able to assess relatively quickly, to not spend too much time on this. So you try it a little bit, maybe for one day or two. And after one day or two, if you really see that this is going nowhere, maybe you should move on to something else. But if you can, you can try a random idea, uh, spend a few days on it. And if you see, oh, maybe there's something there, then you can continue. Um, yeah, that's that's my personal way of, uh, of operating to get these uh, these new ideas. Okay, and uh, here is a final question in the QA panel uh, from Mosofa. 
yeah, but so far. And in yeah. terms of, yeah. In so terms, in terms of, of block okay. cipher and stream cipher, which one yeah. is the more frequently used in the industry? So, okay, just to put into context, so block cipher, I already explained what it is. So stream cipher is a, a little bit different because you get a stream of data and the stream cipher would generate from the key some uh, chain of random bits and will uh, XOR, will uh, add basically this chain of random bits to your data to directly cipher it. So it's, uh, the process is a little bit different. So in terms of block cipher, which one is more frequently used in the industry? Actually, both are used. Um, they have a they have lot of, uh, and unfortunately, I think industry is still using uh, RC4, for example. Uh, so there are also, also products that are a little bit in between. There are now things that are not really block cipher, not really a stream cipher, but some a bit in, in between. I don't think there's one that is more, I mean, I, I, don't, know the, I don't know the numbers. I don't know, there's, I don't think there's one more used than the other, but normally every day now, people should be using AES, which is a block cipher. Uh, so that's what people should be using at this moment. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I'll probably. Yeah, yeah. So probably there's another uh, question uh, that sure. has not been answered oh, okay. uh, from the Q&A, which is uh, from uh, Zing Zing Zhang. Zing. Yeah. Sure, yeah. So, yeah. And, and that's also a question that I had in mind, which is regarding post quantum cryptography. Uh, yeah. So, the question is can you talk a little bit more about post quantum cryptography and uh, the talk about the fact that uh, elliptic curve cryptography is secure even in the quantum computer uh, domain? So, not okay. <laughs> so, okay. Can I change? Okay. Try to remove this. Yeah. So yeah. So of course, one of the very, very probably the hottest topic at the moment uh, in cryptography are quantum computers. And what are they? What is the impact of quantum co computers on cryptography? So as I mentioned already, um, symmetric cryptography is relatively untouched with regard to quantum computers. You can still do more things. Uh, it's more you get more powerful attacker. You can indeed attack more things, but it's not uh, dramatic. Basically, so we know how to resist this relatively well. Now, for asymmetric crypto, depending on the kind of asymmetric crypto you'll be using, uh, that might be a really, really a big problem. So, actually, what happened currently in cryptography? Uh, they organized a competition. You, as you can see, we love to organize competition in in, a, in a cryptography. So, the NIST is organizing a competition going on right now, and they are trying to select uh, again different portfolio uh, depending on the kind of primitive that you want for quantum resistance algorithm. So basically the idea is that if one day quantum computers come, uh, we want an algorithm that can resist uh, this kind of, uh, of threats. Uh, it's hard for me to explain to you why, just, just, uh, just, just uh, here in a, one, in a minute, why quantum computers can break uh, uh, some of the crypto system that, we, that we're using. But basically you get some uh, alternatives that's supposed to be quantum resistance. So for example, you can have uh, uh, lattices, so um, Cypher's uh, asymmetric crypto based on lattices is supposed to be resistant for this uh, quantum uh, compute time algorithms. Or you also have some, um, um, some design based on code theory, which is supposed also to be uh, resistant against this uh, quantum algorithm. But this is, um, I think, uh, a very, very different uh, study because these algorithms are much more complex than the one I just described here. There's a lot of different parameters you have to adapt the size of the key, uh, size of very different parameters according to the best algorithm known. And those algorithms are actually getting also better. So you're gonna have to adapt the key up to this um, increased knowledge in, in, in these areas. So this is a very uh, lively uh, area, I think, and it's not stable at all at the moment. In comparison, symmetric key cryptography is much more mature, I think much more stable. We know more or less what are the limits. We know how to do things more or less now, I think. Uh, for this area of uh, symmetric cryptography, it's really uh, it's really moving a lot. I think. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, uh, uh, yeah. I'll I'll just add one more question here, which yeah. is a question that has come in from uh, the students when they registered uh, before the talk. Uh, so this is like uh, probably not in exactly in context to the talk, but a more generic question. This comes in from Jian Jiao, which is like. Uh, could you share your thoughts on the applications of reinforcement learning uh, and how it can be applied to cryptography for certain applications, if there are any? Yeah. So, okay. So this is, so if you think about it, a cipher, 
So I take again a symmetry key cipher as an example. A symmetry key cipher is really something that should be hiding any structure, right? We want confusion, we want diffusion. So we really want to make sure there's no structure that you can see. And what a machine learning algorithm is will be trying to do is exactly the opposite. It's trying to find some kind of structure inside your, 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 your cipher, basically. So basically, a cipher is really exactly the kind of primitive that will make machine learning impossible to work, or in, basically uh, inefficient. Now, this being said, um, people are starting since a few years to take a look at how machine learning can be used to attack a reduced number of rounds for the ciphers. So not the entire cipher, just a very reduced number of rounds. So take AES, for example, AES has 10 rounds. So can you use machine learning to break maybe three rounds of AES, for example? How far can it go? And this is interesting because maybe, not, 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 it's not interesting because it's gonna outperform the human. I don't think it will. Uh, but it might be interesting because it might provide new ideas of attack. So maybe the machine learning algorithm will come up with uh, some distinguisher, I mean, some, some kind of attack on your cipher. And maybe the information that is using to, to, to create this attack is something that nobody has used before. This might be possible, actually. The problem is that there's a problem of explainability of the, of the machine learning algorithm. So if the machine learning algorithm is a bit of, of a black box, uh, it, it will be able to learn, it will be able to, uh, to, to tell you, to classify for you, but it's not gonna tell you really how it's, it's classifying. So in the end, this is not really useful. So actually one of the projects that we have started in our lab is exactly on this. We try to use machine learning algorithm to try to analyze some of the ciphers, but we try to make it such that we can do some kind of explanation because we want to know if the machine learning algorithm is learning something, we want to know what is learning, and maybe use that later for us to provide new type of attacks. Now, in terms of reinforcement learning in particular, I don't see any direct application. I mean, this is very, 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 very new topic. So I, I don't know of any person having really used the reinforcement learning to break ciphers like successfully. Um, yeah. Yeah, one last question from for the sure. Q&A panel uh, for, from Yeshua. Uh, which says, uh, uh, which is again on the topic of uh, post quantum cryptography, and he says that uh, what are your views of uh, quantum key distribution versus developing quantum resistance primitives? Yes, yeah, so, so th those are two different things. So even though there is quantum word in it, uh, those are two different uh, goals. So quantum key distribution is basically trying to use the quantum effects to make sure that nobody was able to see, I mean, to, to tamper with your key distribution. So, you know, you have this problem of key distribution in symmetry key cipher, right? You, you must have these two keys between the two participants. And at some moment they have to exchange this key at some point, right? Uh, so what they propose is basically to have this uh, quantum key distribution and in such a way that you can be sure that nobody tampered with this. And you can be sure that this key then has been uh, securely transmitted. The problem is with this is that in practice, there's always, I mean, this is an engineering problem at some point, there's always a place where the quantum effect will not happen anymore. And then people will be basically able to attack just this particular moment, basically. So you have some devices basically located somewhere and another device located somewhere. And you, you might have problems on these devices themselves. So again, that's a problem of modeling. They assuming some, uh, they will be assuming some, um, some um, some yeah there would have some assumption on how the attacker what the attacker can do but in practice it might not always be the case so this is not contradicting the the, the quantum physics or anything it's just that in practice uh, security has to take into account a much broader set of uh, assumption than just saying we have a secure canal of communication with the quantum and that's it so this is very different from using quantum algorithm quantum algorithm is, is about having quantum computers uh, that, I don't know if this will happen one day. I mean, this is about, uh, uh, will quantum computers be uh, able to scale one day? Uh, that I have no, no idea. I'm really not, uh, not in this area at all. Um, but yeah, basically what the, what the community wants to do is to protect against this and to be ready. Basically what we want to avoid is that one day quantum computers, they arrive and then we are uh, taking uh, without warning and then everybody scrambles and we have no replacement. So this is why we have this competition going on is that if one day, maybe in 10, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, if one day quantum computers can scale and break things, we have a replacement and everybody's fine. Because it is true. If we have computers, quantum computers today and if you can indeed uh, make them scale, that will be catastrophic. 
I mean, you can break a lot of things, a lot of things in the world was completely scrambled. That would be like, uh, consequences would be like uh, horrific, really. Yeah. Uh, here's another new question from yeah. QA session, EKA, from EKA, yeah. I'm developing a text-based encryption model, but I'm tra having trouble. I got encrypted text in the form of non-created text. What is your suggestion? Uh, so I'm developing text-based encryption model, uh, but I'm in trouble. I got encrypted text in the form of non-printed text. What is this? Okay, so I guess what you want is that you want to encrypt something and that it still, still looks like uh like meaningful text i guess that's what you you mean i guess or letters maybe so if you want for example to have a text uh let's say ascii characters or maybe not ascii or maybe alpha uh alphanumeric uh characters okay so a b c d up to z and uh, one to zero and then the space so if you want to encrypt only in this particular space you need something called format preserving encryption so there's 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 an a field of study in this area. So how to encrypt data so that it stays in some subset. Okay, that's exactly what format preserving encryption means. It means it keeps your format. Uh, this was originally used for banking because in the banking industry, you want to cipher the, the digits of the credit card. So when you send your, when you give your credit card numbers, you want to cipher these numbers. But for historical reason, there's a lot of people in between analyzing your your like some people providing services analyzing your credit card numbers and these guys they can only handle digits they cannot see a letter they cannot see a special character or anything they want to have digits so people created special kind of ciphering encryption um, encryption algorithm that keeps a digit as a digit and never change this so you can have the same for alpha alpha numerical uh, characters for sure yeah this is called format preserving encryption Okay. You, you can contact uh, me if you want. No problem. You can send me an email, and I can give you more information. Okay. And uh, any, uh, anyone have any about anyone has has question, and you can send a question in QA panel, or raise, or you or you can raise your hand, and ask questions live. Anyone has questions? Okay. So I have two questions to ask. Yep. Yeah. Uh, the first question, and I, my question is about a general research, uh, uh, general research. And the first question is about, uh, you just mentioned that uh, collaborative uh, research, and I want to know how to strike a balance between independent research and collaborative research. And you know, independent research uh, also requires intensive time and energy, but with low efficiency. Yeah, you, you always do research uh, on your own and uh, without any other's help. And, uh, but for collaborative research, and you can make research stay in the comfort zone with high throughput because if you are good at uh, if you are good if you are good at mathematical reasoning, and you can involve in many projects and do mathematical things, and you can have a lot of papers, but uh, you only train your mathematical reasoning skills. It is not uh, it is not good for you. But uh, but uh, a lot of papers. Is uh, are, are meaningful because it, it can help you graduate as a junior student, a junior PhD student. So, how to strike a balance between um, independent research and collaborative research? Sure. So, yeah, that's uh, of course uh, a very interesting question. Um, first, I would like to say I don't think there's a definite answer to this. So, I think it depends on the, on the people. So, from my experience, I've seen very successful researcher doing no collaboration at all because it was in their character so basically they did not want to collaborate so much they had their own ideas they know very well what they wanted to do and they they wanted to do it their way you know sometimes you want there's different ways of doing research uh how you explore things and how you verify things etc and sometimes it's a pain to to actually collaborate with other people because they will do it differently you have to trust them and for some people it's difficult to do that so i don't think there's a different answer i think it depends on also on your on your character now okay. for sure by collaborating, it's sure that you're going to improve your, your productivity, right? Because you're going to be exposed to new ideas. You're going to ex yeah. be exposed to critics. And I, I think that's very important. I think that's even more important to be exposed to critics, people that will say, no, this, this, your idea is bad. <laughs> and actually, this will save you a lot of time. So, so this, this happened to me a lot when I'm discussing with other people. And they tell me, oh, no, this idea is bad because of this or this. Oh, thanks. Actually, you saved me maybe two days of work. So that, that's also how you improve your, your, your productivity. So in general, I would say um, in terms of this productivity aspect, maybe it's good for, uh, so in our area in cryptography, we always say that three publication is what you should have to have a PhD basically. As soon as you have three publication, you kind of, 
have enough content. I'm not sure if that's a good measure for all different areas because I know in some places you might publish much less than this. Uh, so of course uh, you have to adapt this, but basically I would say as soon as you collaborate enough to get three publication, at least in my area, then you can really do what you want. If you want to work alone, because that's what you want to do, then it's fine. At least you secured something, enough papers, uh, so that you know you're 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 good to graduate, and you know that everything is going to be fine. But again, I don't want to say. Of course, for me, collaboration was good, but I don't want to to give as advice to everyone. Yes, you should collaborate, and you should force yourself to collaborate. Not not if you don't feel like it. If it's a pain for you, and you know what you're doing, and and you're happy with uh, working alone, and you're proud of what you're doing, I think that's what is important. I think as as long as you are interested in what you're doing and you are happy with what you're doing, I think that's what's the most important. As long as you keep your motivation. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great answer. And uh, he has another question. Um, it's um, yeah, for me, uh, a junior PhD student, I have uh, many ideas in my mind about my research, and some of them are impacted and insightful, but requires a long time, long time and uh, tedious jobs. But some of them are are low a low hanging fruit. It's simple, but I think I can finish it in a short time. And how to make decisions when, uh, when you or when you are when you are a junior PhD student? Because, uh, yeah, uh, making decisions is hard. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, so I yeah I I think again comes in the the minimal requirements for for your PhD. I think as soon as you secure enough result for your PhD, then you can do more or less what you want. Okay. So I would say the low hanging fruits that are that are here also so that you can have at least some result for your PhD. So this is good. In general, though, once you have this minimum requirements uh, secured, um, I would say going for the long term goals. And even if it's more effort, it's, it's usually uh, better. Um, my, that's my personal view. But if you cannot choose, I mean, that's the role of your PhD supervisors. So the PhD supervisor has the experience uh, to, to be able to tell you actually this one, the reward uh, reward efforts uh, trade-off, maybe this one is not good. You know, it, it will see, okay, how much work you're gonna have to do and you will see the pos possible impact of this and you will be able to tell you actually, this is maybe a not, not a good deal. So I think this is really the role of the uh, supervisor. Personally, as a supervisor, I don't expect PhD students to be able to really answer this question. That's my personal view again. Okay, okay. Yeah, maybe maybe your supervisor has, has uh, have no idea about your research and it, it, uh, they just... Okay. Uh, Provide funding. Yeah, in that case, you can try to talk to other people. So supervising is not maybe only about your supervisor, but it, so for example, in my case, again, um, my supervisor, which I uh, really love, <laughs> but uh, he was uh, um, not. Uh, he could not really devote too much time because he was working in the company. So actually, I, I took on myself to work with other people. Um, okay. So I took on myself to contact other people. In, in the end, those people were also kind of my supervisor as well. I mean, they give me a lot of advices. Uh, so of course, I, I get some rejections, uh, which means that sometimes I contact some people and they tell me, uh, well, no, or sometimes they don't even reply. But that's okay. I mean, yeah, you're gonna live through that, it's okay. And but the people you're gonna be contacting that's gonna be helping you, this is very good. Again, it's more collaboration, new ideas, new uh, opinion. Uh, and I think uh, then you can try to contact people that are relevant in the area you are talking about and try to, to discuss with them. Yeah, if really this even does not work, uh, if this does not work, uh, if you met all the requirements again, so if you have enough paper to graduate, then I think you can go all in. You can you can go all in and you can take the topic that you that interests you the most, so the one that will provide you the most motivation, and you can go all in and spend a lot of time. I mean, this is what research is about. So yeah. okay, okay, thank you, thank you everyone. Thanks for your attention.